There's an interesting story that's supposed to be told, or there can be an interesting story, in how different people arrive at um, atheism, because I suppose for most people you're not raised atheist, it's, it's, it's still relatively unusual, and so you're raised with a religion that at some point you have to decide to abandon, and um, that's a different story for everybody. Um, within um, evolutionary biology, of course, one of our most famous people is Darwin, and in early in his career, and earlier in his life, and um, one of the careers that he considered was to be a, uh, a vicar of some kind, because it was it was, a, it was a good job for a gentleman. You know, he had a good income, but he didn't end up doing that. Um, but even that said, um, the stories of his deathbed conversion, or um, the stories of the turmoil um, that he's apparently like some people say he felt um, from having come up with the explanation for how evolution works and the con and the conflict that has with his religion. I, I've, I've never seen any evidence for that. I think it's mostly made up, especially the deathbed conversion. It's definitely completely false. But whether he felt any turmoil, maybe he did at some point. I mean, everybody goes through something when they're trying to think about it, what it is they're doing. But um, part of why I was talking about this in the personal story is because I just finished reading this book, which is actually just been published this week. It's called The Young Atheist's, Han oh. Atheist's Handbook. And it's um, written by a guy called Alam Shaha. And um, he, this is a mixture between um, a memoir um, and a kind of a philosophy of atheism. And so Alam is, um, he was born in Bangladesh and his family moved to the UK when he was about four years old. And um, so he, he was raised Muslim and in a quite traditional um, in a quite traditional uh, community. And um, he finds that, especially, I think, he, he thinks, I, I, so I know Alam, that's how I got an early copy of the book, and so he was telling me part of the reason he wrote this book is because he thinks it's, it's kind of easier um, for white people to be atheist. And, and it's probably, I think that's true because, no, I think it's true because um, there is less of this, you are rejecting less in terms of the traditions within your community. And so he found it very hard because when he was, when he became atheist, he felt that his community, he was turning his back on a lot on his community and so there was a lot of difficulty. And in his opinion, um, there are many um, Muslims or ex-Muslims who don't believe anymore but who are very um, shy about admitting that and they're, they keep it private so they don't believe but they are unwilling to admit this publicly so part of what he wanted to do was to give his personal story and there's certain elements to his personal story which are kind of I think the, they're quite similar with mine so they might be um, similar with um, other people as well and part of it is that um, he was lucky enough in his life to have a very good education and have access to books, which meant that he had good access to ideas that were not just the ideas that his parents gave him or that his community gave him. He was did really well in school and he got a, uh, he got a scholarship to a private school as well, which helped him. Um, he also, though, um, has experienced a lot of racism growing up in London. And this meant that he was already used to kind of being different and odd. And so, um, when he, so he experienced a lot of racism and so when he became atheist eventually, there's a very interesting thing within this book, which is that he um, feels a very strong need to defend um, Islam, which is kind of, seems kind of contradictory for someone who has personally rejected it, but he, um, he really um, is upset by Islamophobia because of course that is just one kind of racism, deciding you pick a few bad individuals or bad behaving individuals and decide the whole group is the same. And so despite being somebody who has rejected Islam personally and, and uh, is no longer Muslim, he finds himself defending um, um, Islam against Islamophobia. And he likens it to um, homophobia and other kinds of general, like ra racism and other kinds of generalized phobias we have. And so he tells the story of meeting a man on the bus um, one time shortly after the um, July, was it 7th of 7th July? 7th. Yeah, um, attacks in London. And this man who was sitting there kind of um, quietly with a can of beer or something, and probably it wasn't his first, um, kind of looked over at Alam, made eye contact and said, you know, can I ask you a question? 
and thinking it was going to be something about, you know, where's the next, where's my bus stop? He said, yes, of course. And he goes, why do you people hate us so much? And Alam um, understood from the question that what he meant by you people was Muslims. And even though um, he no longer identified as Muslims, he answered anyway and just said, and he said, actually, I think the perfect answer, he just said, we don't, and I'm sorry you feel that way. But he, so he's experienced, I think, a lot of um, contradictory feelings, which I think everybody does feel when, it's, when, they're, when they're developing and they're um, trying to think about their atheism, because, because then most people have thought about their atheism. And um, I can't remember all the things I was going to say. I was going to say so many things, but uh, <laughs> but um, there's a, there's a very other, there's another very nice um, story in the book, which is not much to do with atheism, but has probably a bit to do with um, uh, uh, it gives you a good example of how um, unprejudiced Alam is, because he talks about love as well, and he talks about um, how some people experience religion like a like almost like a kind of a, a love, right? That they you 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 fall in love with somebody and you're unwilling to accept criticism in the same way that people are unwilling to accept criticism of God. And he talks about then how also how religion is it can be quite interfering in people's experience of love because it tells them who who they may or may not love. And so you may not love somebody of the wrong religion and many religion and many religions also tell you you may not love somebody of the wrong gender. And um, this um, um, has been described as a somewhat um, perverse preoccupation with what other people do when they're naked. But, um, so, but Alan t talks about, in a really nice piece, he talks about the first time anybody ever told them, said, said to him the words, I love you, which is a very special thing to hear. And um, he was about 17 at the time, and he was working in a local cinema or something like this, and there was one of his good friends who he noticed something was stra became strange in the friendship, and he thought something's going on in this friendship. He didn't understand if he had somehow offended the person. So one time they went, uh, um, they went for a bit of a walk and a bit of a chat, and he says to his friend, um, you know, what's happened? Um, is there something gone wrong with our friendship? And his friend, who happened to be male, turned around to him and said, no, there's nothing wrong, but I, I love you. And so this was, he didn't even know that his friend was gay, and Alam isn't gay, so he had to give him the kind of unfortunate, um, but kindest response you can is, I love you too, but only as a friend. But it's just, it's, um, the, the book is lovely in that it's talking about all these different contradictions that um, come about in terms, of, uh, in terms of religion, how religion can interfere a bit too much in, in your life and in your enjoyment of life. And um, I think it's, it's a really nice book because it's personal and because it mixes um, the memoir with um, the, the philosophy because um, I don't think many people decide to be religious or not religious on purely um, theoretical grounds, right? So you can't convince somebody um, based on theory to, to what, what they should believe. So it, it's based a lot on life experiences and that's why the personal story is, um, is really, really nice. Um, and so I think there were lots of other things I was going to say about um, genes and uh, I don't know if any people are interested in it. <laughs> but um, you know, in terms of evolution is this area within, um, is this area within science that has the biggest conflict of course. And um, so there was, uh, so this is just all little collections of random things put together, but I don't know if any of you read um, about the um, the new visitor centre up at the Giants oh, Causeway. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> creation museum in the front. <laughs> and, so, and so somebody has campaigned, it seems successfully, to get um, a caveat put in there that this, you know, the, the, the geological explanation isn't the only explanation. Um, and Shane Hegarty wrote a nice piece about this in the Irish Times during the week, pointing out that they nobody campaigned for the actual giant Crossing. <laughs> oh, you can pay for that. Okay, okay, that, that would have been good. <laughs> if somebody put that story in, that would have been good. You know, the, the, there, there are three. There are three stories that explain this. One god did it. One giant, which Finn giant? Finn McCool was it? Finn yeah, Finn McCool uh, did it. And then, of course, um, it's the it's the cooling properties of volcanic rock, which is a much more yes. boring story. <laughs> But, um, but Shane wrote an article about this um, during the week in the Irish Times, and since then it started receiving rather um, angry 
perhaps hastily written emails from creationists claiming that he, it is he who is the narrow-minded one by, uh, who, who won't accept the, um, the other view of the, uh, yeah, the age of the earth being 6,000 years and all of this kind of thing. And to which um, Shane has replied saying, you know, um, I'm sorry, but I'm not sure it's possible for us to have a debate, have a sensible debate. To which they reply, going, "Aha, I win," because <laughs> because that will do it apparently. Um, but um, yeah, so so in terms, so this is so this is an area that I found myself in a few times. You know, um, you know, defending defending science against um, religious views, especially evolution, because it is the one that people feel um, because because it directly contradicts Genesis and Usher, our, who's, I'm, I'm, a, I'm from Trinity and Usher is one of our um, esteemed um, academics of, uh, and we have theatres and rooms named after Usher and, and even um, I have a student who's studying with me who's on an Usher fellowship which is rather <laughs> ironic, I think if Usher knew that he'd be very disappointed, but Usher is the fellow who went through the Bible and counted the number of big acts and decided it was 6,000 years ago that the, the world created, uh, the world um, originated. But there is a thing, I think that, so one time in a lecture, um, a student who was, I'm pretty sure, was just trying to be cheeky, because um, I teach, I, I lecture on evolution. So this guy, and we, and I just, we just had this um, quite detailed um, lecture on evolution, and I say, any questions, as I always do at the end. And this guy raised his hand and goes, yeah, so what do you think about the, the book of Genesis or the creation story or something like this? And I know he was just being cheeky because he had that kind of smirk on his face. But, um, but I decided I'd answer him anyway. And, um, and so I said, well, you know, my opinion, which is just my opinion, but um, I think that these stories were an initial attempt to try and understand things. You know? So we have, um, you know, the, so you, every child asks why, 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 and everybody tries to figure out why. And at a certain point, people came up with these stories, which was possibly the best that could be done at the time, or it's an allegory, or it's both, right? But at some point in time, people decided to freeze that. So where at one point, religious people were also inquisitive and being inquisitive was um, allowed and encouraged, then it became suddenly shut down. And so, and that's probably where the conflict with science began because science is all about asking questions. It's all about um, being willing to revise your opinion based on the evidence. And uh, it's all about um, being ready to um, update your knowledge, to update your opinion and to, to move on. And so that's probably where the biggest conflict comes from, though, like I say, lots of scientists are, uh, um, are actually uh, religious as well. So um, I'm really, um, I'm very happy to take questions, which I, if people have them, because that's probably m more, um, but I'm gonna finish first. But, um, <laughs> so somebody has one. Um, <laughs> but, um, so, uh, because that's probably, uh, because I, I've, I have never got up and talked about atheism before, which is why I don't really have a really good spiel. I've, I've, get, I've done debates. I debated William Revel once, which was fun. Um, it, was, it was really too easy because I'd read all his arguments previously on the science page of the Irish Times. So I knew what he was going to say ahead of time, so I was ready to answer them. Um, and, it was, and it was good fun. It was in the hist in Trinity, and the motion was that this house believes in God, and we did vote God down. Not that anybody listened. But, um, and, he, and he wrote his, his his column the next day um, ranting about proselytizing atheists, but I'm not sure who he was talking about. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, anyway, I just wanted to end before we, I'll, I'll, I'm happy to take questions, but I'll end with um, actually the end of Alon's book because I just think it's really beautiful. So um, it's got some, um, I'm going to have some bad pronunciation in here because I don't know how to say all these things, but um, he writes, as a child I was taught to say La ilaha illallahu Muhammadur Rasulullah on countless occasions, both at home and in the mosque. I uttered these, those words mindlessly, not knowing until I was older that they meant there is no God but Allah and Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. It is a declaration of belief that I was made to recite when I knew no better. Now that I do know better, here is my declaration of unbelief. I am a kafir, an infidel, an apostate. I do not believe in God, I do not believe in God, I do not believe in God. I want to write that sentence millions of times over, for once for every person in the world who is not free to write it or say it for themselves. If you are free to say it, join me and sing it, scream it, shout it. Thank you. <laughs>